Good morning, my AMST 140 students for the summer of 2021. This is your professor, Donald Earl Collins. It is Monday, um, beginning of week one in this case for 2021. That is Monday, May 10th, 2021. So welcome, welcome to the course. Welcome to all that this course has to offer you over the next six, really six and a half weeks. It's not really a full seven weeks. Um, as you probably are aware, this course is a strictly online course. There is no um, live, nothing that happens live or in real time in this course. Um, everything is by remote. Everything is virtual. It basically means that I will not have live contact with you unless you want to meet with me one on one. Um, and a lot of this, in fact, pretty much all of this is outlined in your syllabus or somewhere in Blackboard. So what I want to do is give you an overview of the course and expectations that I have um, over the next, say, 15 to 20 minutes. For the most part, the videos in, in this course, which are the video lectures, um, will basically be between 10 and 20 minutes in length. There might be a couple that are like 22, but they're basically combining two weeks' worth of materials. So in reality, even though it's for one week, we're covering about a little bit more than two weeks worth of material each week in this course because it's a summer course everything's compressed so the rationale behind doing this course strictly asynchronously isn't new it's it might be new to AU but it's not new in general um, especially when you have students who are not necessarily in the continental US right I know some of you are overseas in Europe I know some of you are in China I know some of you are in Taiwan or Korea and other places so you're scattered and so the truth is is that this course makes it more convenient for you as a student who might not be in Washington DC or on the East Coast or even in the continental US to take a class get credit for it get a grade for it and learn something in the process and so this class is really set up so that you can do everything while fulfilling deadlines um, do every, doing everything essentially on your own, which takes a lot of self-discipline. It takes a lot of concentration and keeping up with materials, and, you know, reading materials, vi audiovisual materials, any other materials that might be part of this course. So, so you know, so I just wanted to give you some basic guidelines. One guideline to think about is is that just because the course is online and can be done anytime doesn't mean I'm obligated to respond to you when you email me at 1 a.m. or 12 midnight or on a Sunday afternoon or whenever you basically feel like it right that's not to say that you shouldn't email me if you have legitimate questions or you literally can't find something but should not be your first option because I have put together a 16 page syllabus which has basically a third of the syllabus is your schedule it's your schedule, what's due, when it's due, how I want it, um, what you're supposed to read, what you're supposed to watch, listen to, etc., etc. It's there in glaring detail. The links to stuff that's not part of the readings under content in Blackboard are all in the class schedule. So please, absolutely, I'm practically begging you guys to read the syllabus understand it, get as much understanding and thoroughness out of it and uh, as thoroughly as you can and be as thorough about it as you can. Because if you are just sending me a general email, hey, I don't know where anything is, that's, you know, it defeats the purpose of me spending hours putting together a syllabus so that you don't have to ask me that question. And by the way, if it's not in the syllabus, here's, here's something that you should think about doing since the course the platform of this course is Blackboard. It's not me in the lecture hall. It's not me doing weekly discussions online through Zoom. It's literally Blackboard. So if you're looking for how to do the week one discussion, click on the link on the tab for discussions in Blackboard. If you need to do your um, reflections for this course, click on the word assignments, the assignments tab in Blackboard and go to the blog where you can, you know, cut and paste from Word your um, first reflection for this course. If you want to hand in your proposal for your DC DMV related project, do, do that on your assignments. If you're looking for the readings for week one, 
look under content because that's where the course content is. If you're looking for the syllabus, look under content because that's where the syllabus is. If you want samples of video um, presentations or an executive summary or how to write a proposal, that's also under content. Everything for this course, except for you know new videos or the week by week video lectures, is already uploaded. And the reason why I don't upload all the videos at one time is because we're doing this on a week by week basis. You can read ahead in the lecture notes, but you're not really going to fully understand everything until I load up the videos for each week. And the reason I don't do that is I don't want someone reading, you know, going through six weeks of videos all at one time and then go, aha, I know everything in the course when you don't. <laughs> right? Sometimes going through the course and the pay at the pace that the course sets in terms of the readings is probably the best way to go. I'm trying to give you guys some sort of um, spread of stuff so that you're not overloading yourself in a seven week course that's really six and a half weeks that you know, comes to discussions, basically six weeks and we're covering about 14, 13, 14 weeks of material in that stance. In that stand, you know, not thoroughly, but we're still mostly covering that. So I just want to make sure that you understand that the onus is on you. I've already done a good portion of my job, probably 75, 80% of it, by putting together the syllabus and putting together the Blackboard classroom for you. You need to go through the material, read it, understand it, reread it if necessary. And if it really doesn't make sense in terms of that, then send me an email. Maybe and there and there might be things to clarify. I'm sure it's not perfect. I'm sure there are things on there that I could, you know, clarify a bit more. Those sorts of things. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on things that might need need some clarification next. But I want to make sure first, read a syllabus, read a syllabus, read a syllabus, read a syllabus. Click on the various tabs in Blackboard, particularly the Assignments tab, the Threaded Discussion tab, and the um, Content tab, because that's pretty much where you're going to be clicking most of this semester, most of this course, or most of this summer session. So, so what's really involved in doing this course? Reading the syllabus. <laughs> reading the syllabus and reading the syllabus. But aside from that, in reading the syllabus and going through Blackboard, you also have several things to do. The number one thing you have to do is thread a discussion. Thread a discussion is worth 30% of your grade in this course. It replaces completely weekly discussions or weekly lectures. So there won't be me doing two and a half hours worth of lectures for you to download and basically you know, try to memorize in order to get an A in the course. That's not how this course would work, even if it was synchronous, right? Because the nature of the lecture, the nature of the discussion of the uh, Zoom um, meetings I've done with students in this course, it's centered on discussion, hours worth of discussion a week. Well, excuse me, what I've essentially done is translated that into threaded discussions in Blackboard under the tab discussions. So you have six weeks worth of discussion questions to answer. Most of those weeks you, you get to pick from one out of two. Some weeks you have a combined question that everyone's dealing with because I want everyone on the same page on certain things. They're all centered around your audiovisual and interactive material in this class, you know, where you've got multimedia um, stuff, where it's a documentary, or it's a uh, podcast, or radio interview, or um, it's a combination of those things. I wanted it to be not completely burdensome where you have to basically go ahead and try to, you know, develop a paper-like response in answering questions. They're all centered on things that everyone should be able to understand on some level. Even if your English skills are limited because you're overseas and your English isn't your first language, most people can understand what's in a video. Most people can understand a radio interview. Most people can get what's going on um, in terms of interactive media, even if they don't get all the nuances. And so I wanted to make sure that I included everybody in that. And so threaded discussion is, a, is basically, in layman's terms, it's the way online courses work in order to generate discussion. There's no way to know to, who you're online with at the same time. So... You know, this is the way 
that you do this for online courses so that you have some sense of participation in the discussion, so that students are in fact interacting with each other on some level, maybe not in real time, but over the course of a seven day week, you get to post something regarding your response to a particular discussion question, a classmate of yours gets to post something, and there are 19 of you, so 19 of you should post something. The idea is, is that you try to address a question or questions for each week of um, the thread of discussion. Um, if, since since the, the academic week starts on Monday, I have it so that you respond so that you respond with a post or a threaded post by Friday. By the end of the academic week, which is Sunday, you respond to at least one other classmate's post. You're responding to them in terms of how they address a particular question or qu set of questions, you know, from each of the prompts that might be up for that week. And like I said, most weeks you're only responding to one prompt, not necessarily two. You have a choice between one and two, right? Some weeks you're all responding to the same prompt, depending on what the audiovisual material and other multimedia material happens to be for that week. The reading should be there to help you supplement all that. So, you know, you're, you're, even though you're responding to primarily a multimedia, um, multimedia material, you, the readings help supplement that so that you actually have some understanding of the context behind a documentary on Marion Barry or a documentary on Michelle Ree or, or uh, a radio interview that deals with, you know, slavery in the U.S. and in D.C. or some other material. So, you know, that, that's the whole thing around it. And when I say respond, you'll see it in the instructions, but in the syllabus and in general, but I don't expect you to just spout your opinion and say, well, in my opinion, I blah, 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 blah. No. I want you to give a cogent answer that basically mixes a little bit of your opinion, but it's not really based on your opinion. It's really based on your observations. What is this saying to you? What does this mean in the larger context of the other stuff that's part of this class? The lecture notes, the video lecture summaries, um, the readings for this course. So you're putting these materials in context. You're not just going, oh, I thought this film was great. That tells me nothing. And it doesn't tell your classmates anything either. And so it's part of those discussions. And if you miss those discussions, you, you miss posting, essentially you'll have up to one week to do a post before um, things lock. So um, the idea is so that, well, you know, if you were doing a discussion in real time, you wouldn't get to post your question, your answer to a discussion set of, of live discussions three weeks later. Why would I give you that same opportunity for threaded discussion? If you can't participate and you have a legitimate excuse or some re reasonable reason, I will accommodate that and give you time off for that particular week and excuse the absence. But I'm probably not going to do more than one or two of those unless they're extenuating circumstances. So it's the be good at this, you really need to keep up on a weekly basis with the material, right? So, so that's, you know, it's pretty significant. There's also two reflections that you're supposed to do. Those reflections are under assignments, under, you know, when you go into assignments, they'll say reflections one, two, that's a blog. You go into there, you find your name in that blog, and you start posting. You can either compose at the computer your post, um, or you can write it up in Word, and then cut and paste it, or copy and paste it into the, into the text box in the blog. It's a combination of self-reflection, meaning it's got to be personal. It can't just be, well, the readings from week one, two, weeks one, two, and three say this. The readings from weeks four, five, and six say that. It's got to be this reading really, this particular reading, this one reading or two readings or one document or whatever had a real impact on me. And here's why. Providing a combination of summary of what, you know, summary of whatever you read or saw or listened to impacted you. Some analysis of it and how that analysis isn't just intellectual and academic, but also on a personal basis. What does it mean to you to know certain things about DC that you didn't know before? So that's also part of this course. There are only two of them, one in the midway point um, due at the end of week three. The other one due the final week of the course, a um, couple of days before I have actually, the course is supposed to end, submit grades, that sort of thing. Third component of this course is um, a project, not a research project, just sort of a 
dig a deeper dive into some aspect of DC life, culture, history, etc., that you want to take a closer look at. Um, and so that means. You know, if you wanted to look more at gentrification, if you wanted to look more at food culture, if you wanted to look more at um, the use of, of wetlands in D.C. along the Potomac or along the Anacostia River, if you wanted to look at museums and how to reflect whiteness, I mean, whatever, you know, you know and to tourists in D.C. and why D.C. DCers, Washingtonians and people who live in the DMV, don't really frequent these museums as regularly as people think they do, right? There are articles on that. There are pretty much articles on anything regarding DC that I'm bringing up. So you have, it, you have the first two weeks to decide if you want to do a group project with someone else in there. Probably not because most of you probably don't know each other and not going to get to know each other particularly well the first two weeks. So more than likely you're probably doing an individual project. And these projects can take any form. They don't have to be an executive summary. They don't have to be a paper. They, those might be the low-hanging fruit for some of you. But you could do you know, a slideshow. You can do a Spotify playlist of DC-oriented music. You can do um, spoken word if you want to write poetry and write about a particular issue in DC through the lens of spoken word, through rap, through dance, through, you know, what... It, through a regular video presentation, through whatever means. I'm trying to really open this up to give you guys the option of doing so many things. And you'll have from the end of week two when you submit your proposal, and assuming that I approve it right away, until the end of week six to do this project. And it doesn't have to be textual. You don't have, you know, in the sense that you need to explain a few things, but it doesn't purely have to be, let me write a five page or six page paper on this. Or, um, a four or five page executive summary on this. Let me just film it and tell you what I'm talking about. Let me do a collage and write briefly what the de descriptions of the different things in the collage. It can be anything around those lines. Bottom line is I'm trying to make this a creative project that takes a deeper dive for you so that it's interesting to you and not just busy work. You're not just writing stuff to write stuff. And some of you, well, in the in a summer course, there really isn't much opportunity to do that much, especially when we're online. So I want to give you as many opportunities to take your skill sets, you know, because not everyone's really a skilled writer, and apply it in the context of what I'm asking for in this course. We'll talk more about this um, virtual in the virtual unlive sense um, for week two. But I wanted to give you some sense of what's coming down the pike. So those are the main things I'm expecting from you in this course. And so you do need to be self-disciplined. You do need to keep up. You do need to let me know as adults when you do have questions after you've actually looked at all the material and figured out that you really do have a question that's not really well explained somewhere in the syllabus. But one other thing, and I just want to make this clear if it's not clear through the video lecture for week one um, in general, which is this course is not about monuments. It's called Life Inside a Monument because these, because many people who look at Washington, D.C., see D.C. via the American president, D.C. of grandeur, of rich white people, and um, white marble, and, and, and granite, and, and of the uh, Lincoln Memorial, and the U.S. Capitol, and the White House, and, you know, the Smithsonian Museums, the Jeffersonian Memorial, the Washington Monument, the Reflecting Pool. Back to um, this D.C., life inside the monument is supposed to mean the people who live in D.C., who live in this place that has all these monuments. Unfortunately, so many students translate that to mean, oh, we're just going to learn about the different monuments in D.C. That's 5% of the course tops. Um, you'll get that in the first week, through the, in, in week two, with the lecture notes, with the lecture videos, and so on. But most of this course is about contemporary life or near contemporary life and how we got there historically in D.C. You know, since D.C. is uh, the polarity of people who live in D.C. are black, and the majority of people who live in, this, in D.C. are black and brown, uh, meaning black, Latinx, or Latino, Latina, or, um, you know, African black, and so on and so forth, that's the course pretty much from about 1945 on, because from about the late 40s through the early zeros, the double aughts, the majority of the population's black. 
Okay, so I'm just telling you this is what the course is. This is these are the components of the course. So we're dealing with intersectional issues around race, class, gender, geography, sexuality, religion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're dealing with it in an interdisciplinary manner, which means not just historical but anthropological, sociological, social psychology. All of that's kind of mixed into this course. So just want to make sure that that's clear for everyone. And on the final note, um, I'm happy to try to do it this way. I, I actually, I mean, this isn't new for me in the sense that majority, I've, I also teach at University of Maryland Global Campus, formerly known as University of Maryland University College, um, where the majority of courses I have taught have either been hybrid courses or strictly online courses, because um, that's the way the university is set up, it's set up to be, to, for anybody to take these courses anywhere in the world. So. I have a lot of experience doing this. You might not. I imagine as EU students, most of you don't, have not taken strictly online courses before. So bear with me. Be patient. Don't expect immediate results. I am not some missile that you spin up whenever you feel like it and pop out of a hole to answer your questions. Like, you know, you know, some customer service representative for Amazon or something. I'm not on 24-7. So Bear with me. All right, and welcome.